Hello, everyone, and welcome to this first seminar. It's a pleasure to introduce our new series on non-emission physics, which is here more broadly defined as covering all kinds of systems that experience gain and loss. Before we start, we would like to before we start, we would like to um, introduce our first rules. Apologies, we are. Okay, now we have the slide. We would like to introduce our house rules. So please keep your microphones muted throughout the talk and keep your cameras off to save bandwidth. And the, after the talk, you will have the opportunity to ask questions and you can either use the raise hand button on Zoom to ask a question or type your question in the chat. If you're joining on YouTube, you can write your question in the chat there and we will forward it to Zoom. And we have a more extensive code of conduct that you can view online. Let us say a few words about the seminar series, as this is the first event. Um, as I already said, we aim to cover all kinds of systems and effects that arise due to the presence of gain and loss um, over a range of platforms. There has been tremendous progress in the theoretical description of um, non-emission systems, but also in the control of experiments um, to realize such systems. So in this series, we aim to bring these two communities together and foster a dialogue between them. A few, so we are the organizers who run this and um, collection of PhD students and postdocs. Um, but if you're interested in joining us, we're always happy to introduce people, new people to our team. And if you have any ideas, just let us know under non-emission seminar, seminar series 2023 at gmail.com. And with this, we, can, we would like to introduce our first two seminars of the series. Today, we have the great pleasure of having Anja Mietelmann present her, her work on dissipation and nonlinearity as a resource. And next week, we will have Jeff Silberberg speak about strongly correlated open system dynamics. And with this, I would like to hand over to Victor, who will introduce Anja. Thanks, Sarah. So, <clears throat> uh, good. Hello everyone, so today I will be the chair for the session and as Clara said, we had the pleasure to have Professor Anja Mettelmann here. This is like a brief uh, bio of her, she got her PhD in physics from TU Berlin in Germany, then she went to America, uh, she spent up uh, time at McGill in Canada with Ash Clark and then moved as an associate research scholar at Princeton. After that, she got like a very prestigious uh, Emmy Nöder group um, in Berlin. And nowadays, since 2022, she's a professor at KIT in Karlsruhe, Germany, and at the University of Strasbourg. Uh, her research interests include theory and application of engineered quantum systems from both funda a fundamental perspective to applications to things like uh, high precision measurements and information processing. And today, apparently, she will be talking about some sharks. So, um, Anya, uh, if you can please share the screen and the stage is yours. Again, just remind you uh, of the Rawls rules. Please keep your microphone muted. If you have any urgent questions, you can type in the chat. And then if, if it's allowed, I, I will ask the speaker after the talk is done, we will open to questions. <clears throat> oh, great, thank you very much, Victor and Clara. Uh, it's a really nice introduction, let's see. So should I also turn off my camera? No, you can keep, your, you, you, you keep, you keep yours on, <laughs> please. <laughs> hey, I'm just asking. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, um, yeah, he hello, welcome everybody. I'm really honored to be the first speakers of the series. I'm, I'm really looking forward to all the interesting talks uh, we will have. Um, and yeah, so um, you already, I was already introduced. So I'm, I'm since a year at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and the University of Strasbourg and building up uh, groups here and there. Um, and today um, I'm going to talk about sharks. That's true. It will take a second till we arrive uh, at the shark. Um, but in the end, I want to convince you today um, 
the dissipation, uh, which is often considered as something detrimental, um, can be a resource for doing interesting physics and um, as well as nonlinearity, um, both can be really um, like great resources to do um, like things more effectively or in a completely new way. So let me start with um, the first aspect, and this is like, um, oops. yeah, so that's how it goes here. Um, and this is like dissipation. Okay, what do I mean with dissipation? Clearly, we have um, an understanding that in general, if you think of what I call conventional dissipation as something which is uncontrolled, meaning that if we have a system A, um, coupled to an environment, or we call this also a bath. This is, in some sense, just that we lose information into the bath, we uh, have uh, decoherence, and this is something unfortunate in a lot of cases. Um, if we have a recoupling to the bath, and we can assume that the bath is large, um, we model such a system in the framework of um, Lindbad master equations, under the born markov approximation. And this is just a reminder. So this is how the master equation looks like. So the, the um, evolution of the state of the system, yeah, so rho is here really just the state or the density matrix of our system A is given by some part which can be, you know, coherent evolution, which is the, just a, a Heisenberg or a Neumann equation. And in addition, the influence of the bath comes in here mainly in this, this last term, which is our uh, Lindblad operator. It's a super operator, meaning the definition we have here. So this is really like, oh, is here the jump operator. And I hope that a lot of you already have seen that because we will see more master equations in this talk. Um, the, the point I want to make here is that this jump operator in this case of just one system coupled to a bath is a system A operator, right? So this is what I defined here. So as I said, this conventional dissipation is something which we cannot really control or um, manipulate. So this is not the kind of dissipation I want to talk about. So I want to talk about what we call engineer dissipation. And this is what I would consider as controlled. And here we have, an again, to assist our main system A, which is now coupled to a system B, but in a controlled manner, meaning I can, can turn this coupling between A and B on and off, and I have control over it. And now our system B, it's like an auxiliary system, is coupled to the bath, to the environment. And the jump operator now of our Lindlarian is actually a system B operator. And now as I can control the coupling between A and B, I can also control how much dissipation in the sense A sees, right? It's like a door I can open and close as much as I, as I like if I have control over this one coupling. And this is what, uh, on one way, there are other ways as well out there to think of that this as engineered dissipation on our main system A. We can use this now and not only uh, talk about, you know, manipulating one system A, but actually generating something like a dissipative process between two systems. Therefore, we have to adjust our sketch a little bit. So we have now um, a system A and B, which are the two systems where we want to engineer um, an, uh, a dissipative process between them. Because they, but they're not they're not directly coupled, but they're coupled now to an auxiliary system uh, C, which is damped. And now this again, the jump operator here for such a setup is a system C operator. And under the assumption that this system C is strongly damped, and we can um, assume that it's in a steady state, we can adiabatically eliminate it, and then arrive at a new form um, where we have a master equation now for the density matrix of the system A and B together, which has now um, something which I call a dissipative coupling where our jump operator is depending on not only on A, but also on B. That's a non-local jump operator one can think of. So in this kind of coupling mediates um, this, um, this dissipative process. To notice if we couple these two systems, and we will see an example in a second, we also should always be aware that we also can get some coherent coupling mediated by our auxiliary system. Okay, so let's just start with an example of how this can look like. We go with the simplest one one can think of is 
coupled oscillators, right? So we have now, um, I use always these green blobs if I'm talking or blue, green. Uh, uh, if I talk about a concrete system and gray is always a general system, just as a disclaimer. Um, so the, what we have here at hand are three oscillators, A, B, and C. And we assume that they are coupled in a controlled way, and meaning we are, for example, parametric modulation of the coupling strength between A uh, and C, allowing them to be resonantly coupled. So for the interactions I want to consider here between A, C, and B, I modulate each of these couplings uh, at the frequency difference so of these oscillators, so they are um, um, non-degenerate, in frequency. And what I end up with um, is this kind of Hamiltonian where we allow for some detuning for the mode C. And then we have the, the coupling, the simplest one we can think of is just a hopping coupling. So we have here, the C creates an excitation in our C oscillator. Um, a destroys an excitation in A. And so what we have as a process is just the, the swapping of excitation between oscillator A and oscillator B, A, a and C. And the same thing is also true for, um, for the interaction between C and B. So we have hopping between A, C, and B. Uh, and now we want to assume that this oscillator C is coupled to an environment. Yeah, I leave this rather abstract here, um, but with a rate kappa. And this kappa should be one of the largest parameter in the system. So we can assume that C is actually um, like in a steady state and we can then um, adiabatically eliminate it and arrive at a master equation just for our system A and B. Yeah. And there we have exactly the structure I already uh, mentioned before. So we have uh, a part which is the coherent coupling. And this coherent coupling here, you see this, this lambda um, is coming in with this detuning. Yeah. So without the detuning, this coherent coupling is um, would be vanish. Yeah. And um, and you can look at this coherent term and what you see, what you have here is actually a frequency shift on the modes induced by the mode C. And you also have some hopping here, coherent hopping. Huh? In contrast, if you look now at the dissipative part, we have this non-local super operator A plus B coming in with this rate gamma, which is uh, proportional to the kappa, to a damping on mode C. So without this, this damping, um, this dissipative coupling would vanish. And I will not go into details what, if, what kind of effects the, um, this dissipative coupling has, but I can tell you that one thing which uh, will happen is that we get local damping on both modes, on mode A and mode B, and we get what I call dissipative hopping, um, between the modes. Uh, important is that the difference between the dissipative hopping and the, the coherent uh, um, hopping is actually a, a phase. Yeah? So they, these processes are associated with different phases, which is something we want to uh, exploit also later on. Okay, so that said, what can we do when we have is um, like engineered dissipation or these dissipated processes. And I um, want to um, tell like two stories today. So I will keep it rather short and tell you right away what we can do. Um, and the thing is that we can use this engineered dissipation now to actually engineer something what we call non-reciprocity. Uh, and I will, I want to, to do this fast today because I have talked about this also a lot. Um, you can ask me questions later if there are further questions. So, but I want to tell you what do I mean with non-reciprocity. So the, the thing is that normally if we have two systems A and systems B, what happens that they're, and they're coupled via Hamiltonian, for example, then the interaction between them is uh, reciprocal. Yeah, so we have backward and forward processes, system A influences system B and also the other way around. And the question is, how can we break the symmetry of reciprocity? And this is the question um, we did answer. Uh, there are also other, other answers out there. We're not the only people looking into non-reciprocity, but we have found actually a, a recipe which is based on using this engineered dissipation. Um, and to tell you um, in a nutshell how this goes, um, I want to start actually with an example where I am uh, have a completely non-reciprocal uh, situation, right? So 
non-reciprocal, I think, I'm not sure if I said that, but I want to realize a situation where I only have system A driving system B, but not the other way around. So I want to have a unidirectional interaction. So, um, so we start with, an, with the idea of how can we actually do that? And we have here system A, uh, and this is measured by an observer um, with a measurement strength K, and the observer feeds forward this information of what uh, the, the observer obtains from system A to B. Uh, and you can automatically see that this is a, a unidirectional situation. The information flow goes from A to the observer to B. Uh, there's nothing backwards. This is an idealized situation, clearly, but this is what we assume. And we can model such a process uh, uh, straightforwardly by a master equation, right? You can go and start with the conditioned master equation and work your way up to the unconditioned one to include this, um, yeah, to, to look at the... And this is what we obtain. And this is perhaps a master equation some of you have already seen. So this is the, the feedback master equation, but also describes feed forward. Um, and here we have uh, the, this density matrix, which describes the dynamics of A and B. Uh, and the, the first term here is just some noise coming in with this continuous measurement. Uh, so we have here, this comes in with K. And then we have also some noise now acting on, um, on system B, um, which is associated with the feed forward process. But important is that we have here uh, another term, which is the alteration or describes the alteration of the system B due to this feed forward. Yeah, and we can now take this, and this is like this mass equation like really like nicely describes what's going on if this unidirectional um, setup. And if we make now a mapping um, in the form that we just say alpha squared is eta squared gamma, and the, this is the, the feedback strength, and the, um, the, our uh, measurement strength is four gamma, then we can rearrange our master equation to this form. And this is an important form because here we have um, a coherent interaction, which is just the product of our system A operator times the system B operator. And we have a non-local um, dissipator here. Uh, and this is exactly what we need. We need uh, the combination of a coherent interaction and a dissipative interaction in this form to render a system non-reciprocal, right? Because if I forget now about where we came from, I can just tr try to engineer such a form of interaction um, and realize non-reciprocity. And this is um, something which we can, can generalize in more detail and... Um, here is the reference for this, that we can uh, non, uh, engineer non-reciprocity by balancing a coherent interaction with the corresponding dissipative interaction. And yeah, more details are in, in, in that work. And we have um, like done a lot of things in, in regards of non-reciprocity, so because it's really purely general. So the main thing we, we looked at first was thinking about non-reciprocal devices. How can we design um, signal processing devices like isolators, uh, which um, route signals in between two ports unidirectionally, or circulators, which have three ports, and um, which are really, really important if we want to process information with um, in the microwave regime. So if you want to do quantum information processing, like weed out qubits by protecting them. So you need, for example, and you need um, a lot of circulators and isolators um, to, to do so, to read out weak microwave signals. And um, people have, um, like this was a really active field of, or is still a really active field of research, thinking about new ways to design these non-reciprocal devices. Um, so we did this and here are some, some references if you're interested, um, but we also started thinking about like, um, because it's nice, the recipe works, we can understand other works from other people who experiments, um, how, why, why they work and what one has to do to, um, to you know, de design devices. But clearly we are theorists, so we also start thinking a bit about non-reciprocity if we go beyond signal processing. And here's just two uh, recent works out of um, um, my group. And I want to talk a little bit about the first one today in selling us like how can we engineer uh, or how we can we get entanglement in a non-reciprocal system and what can we do with it. And this work was just, it's mainly done by my student Lindsay Orr and collaboration with Said Khan from Princeton. He is Buchholz, a former uh, master student, Shlomi Kotler, who is um, 
in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And it's just, yeah, you can find it hopefully soon in, in PRX Quantum. And before we go there, I just want to say that um, we also can also think of routing in networks. And I want to make the point that this here is like really like, an, for example, an active lattice of oscillators, which you locally control and you can completely route this optical signal in a way, however you want to go between two ports or more ports. And this is not an, like that you have to um, create a non like a non-trivial topological band structure as you as we have seen in uh, in other works. It's really that you locally control the path of which your signal goes, and it's pretty robust if you hit the right uh, conditions. And it's also not only theory. Um, we have um, also collaborated with Oscar Painter's group. KJ Fang was here the lead uh, uh, experimentalist. And we could show that this uh, in an optomechanical circuit, you realize non-reciprocal transmission um, be yeah, between two optomechanical cells. And well, I'm happy to talk more about this if there's interest, um, but um, it's not only theory. That's the main point I want to make. Okay, so but now let's start thinking about actually like how can we go beyond signal processing and what is non-reciprocity in the quantum regime? Because with things we have worked on with the devices, like non-reciprocal devices, this is something where we, um, we model it in the language of um, operators and, uh, and such, but mainly to understand the noise properties and the non-reciprocity itself holds up to the classical level. Uh, so for that, we would not need um, put hats on our objects. Um, so we're interested now in actually what happens if you go to the quantum regime and the first question and simplest question uh, one can ask, uh, how about is it with entanglement generation in non-reciprocal systems? And important is here, we have here an open system, we have um, dissipation, so um, clearly it's not automatically obvious if we can generate entanglement. So what we, what we, what we looked at uh, and is actually uh, a simple, really a simple system can think of, like we, we combine uh, two entangling, uh, entanglement generating interactions. The first one um, is rather straightforward and perhaps also familiar to you. So we have two oscillators, which are coupled via this coherent term, and this is just a two mode squeezing interaction. And this two mode squeezing interaction produces uh, entanglement between um, mode uh, one and mode two, so intra-cavity entanglement, so really just between the oscillators. But if I look what comes out of the system, so um, and then I also generate um, entangled photon pairs. And this, this uh, um, is here depicted in this graph. Um, so we, you have to, if you have entanglement, you have to have a measure which tells you if you have entanglement and how, how, how entangled are you, um, and so how robust is the entanglement. And so here you can have it as a function of a squeezing parameter. And um, you see here two lines. The uh, black one is actually depicting the intracavity entanglement. So just the entanglement inside of the two modes. And here this, we actually have a bound, the L and two bound. So you cannot go beyond that, that value. In contrast to the, um, to the photons coming out of your systems who are entangled here, you can actually have, uh, you have exponential growth or here squeezing parameter is then linear with a factor of two. So this is the coherent interaction. We know how the entanglement uh, works. But clearly what we need now is the corresponding uh, dissipative interaction. Uh, and the dissipative interaction we are choosing is one which has a jump operator of this form. So we have here D1 plus D2 dagger. So a non-local operator with some asymmetry, perhaps. And this was a um, like a dissipator which was already analyzed by Yingdang Wang and uh, Ash Klerk in 2013. And what they found was that uh, actually if you have this kind of system, the intracavity entanglement, also measured here again in the logarithmic negativity, can be, if it's tuned right, be unbounded in contrast to the coherent version. So there is a dissipated process which creates entanglement, this, this one here. And the thing we looked at now is we combine these two interactions, which also exactly match our recipe uh, and uh, realize a non reciprocal system. So the question we ask, does the steady state entanglement survive or not? So we start out um, from modeling the system uh, in the form of a master equation 
Um, we will then also go to use other formalism to model actually the, the, the output field. Um, but this is just to show you the recipe again. So we have here this master equation. We have our coherent interaction um, with the two-mode squeezing. We will include our non-local dissipator. We allow for some asymmetry in the coupling to the engineered reservoir. And um, we will have additional coupling to the outside world. Okay, so this is what we, we have. And then we can then have, you know, calculate some things. We have to, in the end, calculate the electric uh, negativity. This is what we do. And I want to show you right away the result. And the result here is for the output uh, spectrum. So um, here we, we have the uh, entanglement measure, uh, logarithmic negativity, as a function of the phase. Uh, so the, it's the phase, if you go back, here we had the phase phi, which is important because the phase phi has gives us the direction of uh, if you are uh, um, if you go from a from one to two or two to one. So um, and this this phase has to be equal to pi over two, for example, and then we go from two to one, like with perfect isolation. And if we are at minus pi over two, we go from one to two. Uh, so the pi phase flip changes the direction. In between, we are not perfectly non-reciprocal. And at zero, we are always purely reciprocal. What you see here is um, now the entanglement. And there is some asymmetric behavior, as you can clearly so you see. So if we go from two to one, we have a maximum in the entanglement. Right? While if we go from one to two, we are not en entangled. Right? So the entanglement completely vanishes. Uh, so this is a there's a like kind of switching behavior. Um, but overall, if we work at the point where we go from two to one and we stay at pi over two, we actually have a similar behavior in terms of the unboundedness as we have in the two more squeezing interaction. So this is the inset you see. So here if we enhance this gamma, if you're going to the the I think the the orange dashed line here is the standard case, and the black one is the case for the um entang uh, the non reciprocal system and you can see that we actually grow up pretty similarly okay. so this is also as i said there is an optimal asymmetry which is eta equal to square root of kappa over gamma yeah but this is the 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 optimal asymmetry we will work at for the most part so but clearly there is some behavior which is a bit surprising that we have this dependence on which direction we go we are entangled or we are not entangled and so we wanted to understand this a, a little bit better. So first of all, I have to think about that this system is in some sense not complete because I have also my engineered um, reservoir, right? And so how do I get this? So I, in the end, we have we can assume that we have an auxiliary oscillator. So we actually have a three-mode system. Yeah. So this is so this, the same curve as before, but now we we really think of. Uh, as well, what happens with the third oscillator? So we, we we obtain, as we have seen, this 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 dissipator via a third oscillator, which is strongly damped. Um, and now, what we can also ask the question: So what happens now if we do um, look at the entanglement between uh, mode three and mode two, or mode one? And what we find is actually a uh, like a, a really like an like the opposite behavior. So in the regime where we uh, have entanglement between one and two, the mode uh, two and three are not entangled at all. But if we go in the other direction, we actually have generated entanglement between mode two and three. Yeah? So it's a swapping with the phase between, of the entanglement between the modes, yeah? which, um, um, yeah, is, I don't know if it's useful for anything, but it's somehow interesting that we see this behavior. Clearly we would, would have liked, or we want to understand this a bit more, and to do this, we actually found a way to, to map our open system, the yeah, scattering matrix, or, um, to unitary operations, which help us understand what's actually going on. So we perform this map, this S is here, the scattering matrix, D in is our, um, just the input uh, in the quadrature basis, and um, yeah, or in any basis in the end. And we can make this exactly mapping to some unitary evolution with this uh, H up there. Um, 
So what we find, one thing which is interesting that in the end, this whole, like the, the mapping actually does not need much generators. So we completely fine with just using the two mode squeezing between two and three and the beam splitter between one and three. Yeah, and so if we go from two to one, yeah, the case where we have entanglement, we can map our system, right? like we can think of, we have an input like only vacuum and then we, we operate with the unitaries uh, on it. Then we have exactly this order that we first apply a beam splitter and then a two mode squeezer. No other way around, so sorry, exactly. So what happens here is we have, and this picture is probably more helpful. So we have here like one, two, three, it's just meaning we have three vacuum input and then the two and three pass through a beam splitter, a uh, two mode squeezer <laughs> um, and get entangled. Yeah, And then what happens is that we have a beam splitter between one and three and the correlation in a sense gets swapped and we will have entanglement generated between one and two. Right. So it's like an indirect entanglement process, which um, is also what I would call dissipative entanglement. But in the end, um, you have a logic in the circuit. Or if you would have vacuum input and you apply these unitaries, you exactly get what we expect is entanglement between mode one and two. In contrast, if we are doing going in the other direction, we have to swap the order of the unitaries. And this is the case where we don't have entanglement. It also means that we have to swap uh, uh, things in our in our system uh, in our circuit. So now we go one and three pass the vacuum of one and three passes first through a beam splitter, and is then um, and, and and three and two pass through a two mode squeezer. Uh, but it is and clearly it, this will generate entanglement between two and three, what we observe, uh, but it will never generate any entanglement between one and two. Right? One and three just swap their vacuum. And then um, um, one will just live on, but will never be entangled. So this is, gives us some in, intuition what was going on, that we actually have just the reverse order of unitaries. One creates entanglement between one and two, the other one does not. So the, the question is, that's nice. So I think that gave us a little bit more intuition about um, what's going on in the system. But in principle, that's okay. You have a non-red focus system. You have answered the question. Okay, this is um, uh, you can ge still generate uh, entanglement, um, but you can clearly also ask the question: What is this good for? Right. So that's there. There's at first, if you have like a, think of it as a black box, you get entangled photon pairs out. They are as good as the ones if you had a reciprocal system. There seems to be nothing fundamentally, like why do you go through all the work um, um, using a non-reciprocal system if a reciprocal system generates in the same fashion entangled photon pairs, entangled microwave pairs. So for this, we, we have to think a bit more about, okay, what are the, the differences? Uh, and so we, we think first of the uh, like standard two mode squeezer. Uh, so if we have here this like two mode squeezing interaction between mode one and two, this is what I call seeds for the for the um, entangled photon pairs are exactly the inputs or the vac or the vacuum inputs in mode one and mode two, uh, and then the output will be this an uh, entangled state and it's pure. So this is this is this is nice. So but how what happens now if we actually don't inject vacuum? Yes, our seed is perhaps some some um, some thermal input. Yeah? Here we have actually the situation that the um, the output state will be less entangled. You can still have entanglement depending on how 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 much uh, like how how like how hot your input is in some sense. Um, but you're clearly unpure, and you cannot overcome the impurity. You can try to enhance the two mode squeezing interaction to get the enhanced entanglement, but you're going to be unpure which is an unpractical. And the first way you perhaps think, okay, how, how about if I just add something cold? Uh, so if I add another mode, and then um, we, we have the situation here that the, the, the output state will be actually less entangled and still unpure. Uh, so your seed comes then still from your, for your entangled photons and coming out of one and two will still uh, will be the, the cold vacuum input of three and two, but the thermal input will always show up. Uh, so you will uh, not be able to uh, dump the entropy in a third mode. 
here is where your non-reciprocity has some advantage because if we go now and think about the operation mode of a non-reciprocal amplifier, so we already said if we have just vacuum input, we have an entangled and pure state. And now the seed for the state actually comes from the vacuum injected into three and the vacuum injected into two. And if we now here inject a thermal input, yeah, some um, some um, yeah, some some thermal fluctuations, what happens? is that they actually get routed in the case of uh, um, like perfect reciprocity into our mode three. Yeah? And so the, the output state, what you obtain, the entangled photon pairs will still be pure. So you have routed the entropy to the place where you don't care about and have generated um, entangled and pure state. Although you have thermal input, you can think from an input, what means this in the end, this means that your, your oscillator you have is actually low in frequency. Um, so you can generate here um, in some sense, um, or use lower RF modes to generate entanglement and entangle them, which you can't do uh, otherwise. So this is just what I said. So the input of um, mode one is not important and we can also verify this. So if we now look at the entanglement as a function of the temperature of our mode or the average uh, temperature of mode one, you see that the non-reciprocal case, which is the orange line, this is not affected, while the standard two mode squeezer, the, the, the entanglement will just go down. Huh? And importantly, the, um, the state will stay pure. Yeah? And in a standard two mode squeezer, you cannot beat the, the you cannot, um, you will always uh, scale inversely with, with, your, um, with your temperature. And so you will actually um, never be pure again the moment you have thermal input in contrast to the non reciprocal state. So this is nice. And so you can, you can play this game. And now you the, the title, I think, of the paper is as well, Entangling Two Modes. So this is something which you can just do with a uh, teleportation protocol. Yeah, so you take two of our non, of non reciprocal lo loops. You are, um, so we have a thermal, like a hot mode here in A1 and a hot mode B, B1. If you do this um, like perfectly, you can just take the output of your mode twos here and perform, put, um, send them through a beam splitter, perform a measurement, and then based on the measurement result, you perform a displacement on your on your A1 output and B1 output. And then you have, and this is here, the, the if you do everything perfectly, you get... Uh, um, perfectly um, uh, so like two more squeezed vacuum states and you have perfect entanglement and it's pure. Uh, and this is something where you actually now could entangle two hot modes um, and, and generate a pure state. Okay. So this was as much as I wanted to say about how we can use dissipation as something interesting. Um, I don't know when we started. Can someone tell me how much time I have? Left? So you you have ten minutes. Oh, ten minutes. I can do this. <laughs> so the next point is not only to use dissipation, but actually to use nonlinearity as well as a resource. And um, this is something where we then will finally see the shark. Um, so. Without further ado, I, uh, I want to remind everybody or perhaps introduce, if you haven't seen it, an optomechanical system, because we're going to focus on an actual uh, realization here now. So in optomechanical system, we have a, a, like the basic ingredients is that we have a cavity mode um, and a mechanical mode. This is here this, this, the simplest example um, of a fabric perot cavity with one movable mirror. And these uh, two modes are um, coupled via an optomechanical interaction. So this is radiation pressure force. And you can find this in a lot of different systems, um, but this is the, 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 the basic interaction. Yeah? So um, if you are the, the, there's a displacement X, you will modify the frequency of the cavity and the fabric perioral system. You can easily think of that, that you have just a moving mirror. So this moves and then the length of the cavity changes. Logically, you get a change in frequency. So the G here, the small g, is the optical shift per displacement. And although I want to talk about nonlinearity, 
we will um, still, this is a nat naturally open system. Yeah? So we have some dissipation on our mechanics. They are often low in frequency, so they are hot objects often. Um, and then we will also uh, use some driving because the, as the mechanics is often low frequency and the cavity is could be in a microwave regime, gigahertz, or could be also like real, like real photons, uh, in the sense that you have a laser and then you are really high in frequency in contrast to the mechanics. So they are really they don't talk to each other if, if you don't do anything. So you have to drive the system. Yeah, and so the, the way we have an yeah, call an optical drive in the end, it's just a whatever a drive which creates an electromagnetic field inside of my resonance structure. Yeah. And this is just, you know, like um, um, the basic optomechanical system. What we generally do is we assume that we rotate it with respect to the drive frequency to get the time independent Hamiltonian. Um, and then we linearize the interaction because we have a general, this, this, this bare G single photon phonon coupling strength is really weak. And then you are, we are entering the realm of linearized um, optomechanics. Um, and here we have just um, now performed this, this, this linearization. So we had to take our cavity A, which this is just a displacement operation where we have here some classical average value uh, and then plus some fluctuations around it. And then you have this linearized uh, optomechanical coupling. And important is this, this big G is not a multi-photon coupling, multi-photon phonon coupling strength, but uh, in the end you you have can enhance this by driving stronger you can generate now or like, you know, like, like a parametric modulated interaction, which is nice. And a lot of interesting physics has been done. And it's important is that often the way you drive the system will determine what kind of interaction you have. And I have um, here one slide about some driving schemes. There are other variations or combinations of it. And um, depending on if, if we are in a regime where we are what we call sideband resolved, meaning that the this is here the resonance of the cavity. And then like we have the red sideband on the left, just one omega m away. It's resolved, meaning that the kappa, the width of, of, your, of your cavity resonance is smaller than your mechanical line width. And then we have the same, another sideband well, uh, uh, here on the right side, yeah, which is called the blue sideband. And depending on where I drive in the situation, I will get different kind of uh, interactions. If I drive on a blue, I can get an amplification. If I drive on resonance, I get something like a Q and D, a quantum non-demolition interaction. And on red, I can cool. Yeah? And this is the regime where we will focus on. So this is where we are, um, like what we call like the the the, yeah, the red sideband drive, yeah? and the effective Hamiltonian, which will dominate in this regime is exactly the swapping of excitations between um, the cavity and the mechanics. And as they are different in dissipation, the mechanics is much um, much lower in dissipation than um, the, the cavity, the swapping process will, which extracts excitation from the, the mechanics is will dominate uh, and if the right parameters are matched. So we can actually cool the mechanics. And this can be um, like a bit more formalized if we think about this in a language of Stokes and anti-Stokes processes. So we have, if we drive uh, on the red sideband, we can either scatter up in frequency. Uh, this is the dominant process. It'd be cool because we extract an excitation from the mechanics or we can have the Stokes process, meaning we go down. And this is not described by the affected Hamiltonian. This is described by the part we removed. But this process is supposedly in the, in the regime where you can cool, back action cool, as we call it, uh, um, suppressed. Okay, so we can give these, these processes also rates. They scale here with the, with the uh, photon number spectral density. That's in the end just the, the force noise, where you have A dagger A is a force acting on your mechanical mode and the, the noise associated with it. Or the, is the force noise because it's a force acting on it. And this is the numbers, photon number spectral density, which just has a really simple form. And important is that in terms of these rates, that we can obtain cooling of the mechanics when we have actually the, the anti-stokes rate dominating over the stokes. Uh, so the rate for cooling is larger than the rate for heating. And this is the, the regime we want to be in, but one requirement is here that we actually need omega m to be larger than kappa, so we have to be resolved in the resolved side regime. 
Yeah, but the thing is that a lot of devices are not in the in the in this regime, yeah, especially if you also go to to uh, lower frequencies, larger masses. It will be actually not the case that you are resolved. But if we are, um, and you see this in this this graph, this is a bit older. There have been more uh, examples by now. If we take the phonon number, which has been achieved in an experiment as a function of this resolved sideband parameter, you see a lot of the experiments which were successful. Uh, getting closer to the ground state um, are all in the resolved sideband regime, while here on this side there are not much experiment and it's also not possible to cool as effectively with back action with the cooling I just described. So let us take a look at this unresolved regime, regime a little bit more in detail. So what happens is now if we have here again the same picture, but now our cavity is really wide and we are unresolved in the sense that we um, um, the mechanical frequency is um, much smaller than the line. And then we have a situation that the rate for cooling for the mechanics and the rate for heating is actually pretty similar and we cannot cool the mechanics anymore with back action cooling. And there are other ways, and uh, the ways which have been implemented and discussed is, for example, feedback cooling, the, um, where you actually measure the position of your uh, mechanics and then apply the force in the right moment. Um, or and alternatively, there is um, you can also use um, uh, squeezing um, to, to do this. And there have been theoretical proposals uh, or also... Um, um, also, some experiments. The Clark et al. is a is a, is a nature paper from the NIST group. Um, they have used squeezing to cool. Um, there's also a, one one reference I don't have here, but which is a really nice work is um, by the Troitland group in Basel. They um, I hope I'm right with the name, but they have a really nice coherent feedback scheme, which was just recently published in I think PRX, um, where they showed that one can. Um, yeah, one can use coherent feedback as well to call an you know, unresolved sideband machine. Yeah. So these are ideas people have thought about, people have tried to implement it. And the, the root we took is a bit different, although also it will involve some squeezing, because what we did is actually we worked here together with uh, Gerhard Kirchmeier's group uh, in Innsbruck, who did the actual experiment. We just did some calculations. Um, here, um, we, use, we want to use nonlinearity to help us. And this, this nonlinearity comes in the specific setups quite naturally, as we have here in the setup of Gerd and his group. So here we have this the circuit. We have an like an LC circuit with a squid. So it's a nonlinear resonator coupled via like um, or to a mechanical element, which is the cantilever. And you can imagine that if the cantilever has a magnetic tip, and it will, if it moves, it will modulate the flux to the split. And so you have uh, uh, a modulating the frequency. So you have, again, an optomechanical uh, interaction, what you can call this um, like inductively coupled um, magneto uh, electromechanics. Yeah, and they, they have this in the lab. And as a theorist, clearly, we, we just think of these in Hamiltonian. So we have now this nonlinear cavity. We have some uh, are still the remaining part, which is our mechanic optomechanical interaction, and um, and we will add some driving uh, to this is a single tone here we have um, the Hamiltonian for such a circuit, but already derived in two thousand eight by PD Nation and uh, Books and Miles Blanco, um, and they already said that uh, or claimed in the paper that perhaps this 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 nonlinearity can be helpful to enhance the cooling. And also the detection strength. So, um, so this was already out out there. And but we took another look at this uh, work and so, just sorry, more. Than just, uh, yeah. Can I ask you uh, to 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 wrap up? Uh, yes, I will. Do you give me like four more minutes? Yep. And, and then after that, we are we are taking questions. Just to, okay. Okay. Yep. So I will I will uh, try to do it fast. So. The, the main gist is, first of all, we, we will go again with the transplacement transformation and look at the, the photons we have in our system, right? This is just the expression here. So the parameters are on the right. If you have a normal cavity, you will have a Lorentzian-like feature for your steady state photon number. If you have nonlinearity, this kernel linearity, what happens, you get a tilt. And this is what we call the shark effect. Yeah, so we get now this, this curved duffing oscillator behavior that we get a tilted um, num photon number, average photon number as a function of the detuning. 
Yeah, this is the shark. You will see them again in the remaining three minutes. And we will um, we will use this to help us cool better. Okay, so but the other thing which we have in the displacement transformations are the fluctuations. So here I will just right away show you all what happens if we look at the dynamics of the fluctuations. This is all like the shark will go in everywhere. Yeah, we have an we have first of all like a photon enhanced single mode squeezing strength. Yeah, so that is the squeezing, and we will have an optomechanical interaction which will also contain the alpha. The alpha contains the shark. Yeah. And we will have some 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 detuning, which depends as well on the photon number. So some shift. So this first goes in here. And now we can take a look again at this force spectrum, which just gives us then the rates, the strokes and anti-strokes rates. And this, if you have no detuning here, what you see is that in contrast to the case without the curve, you have a strongly shifted and, um, and a little modified kind of um, density uh, force noise. So what we can do, look at now is where when we, when we think about evaluating the Stokes and anti-Stokes rates is actually that the Stokes rate is higher than the anti-Stokes rates. It's just, you can just look at this. And so we would not cool, we would heat here. Yeah? And so this is not optimal. We clearly want to understand this better. I will skip this part and go right away to the point where we have to detune to the right spot, which we call like a critical detuning. And, and then we arrive at the situation that we actually have this nice peak and that the Stokes, the anti-Stokes uh, uh, process will be stronger than the Stokes process. Yeah? And this is perhaps, this is one way to look at it, but this, the thing which is, makes it really prominent is if we look at the effective damping rate, the cooling rate we have in the system. And here you can see this is the case without the curve, but with the curve, we actually get a strong peak at a critical detuning, which we also understand where it happens, where we have a strong enhancement compared to the linear case. So the shark really helps us here to get a strong optical damp. And we can take a look here at the mechanical occupation, which results from that. Here, this is the case if we have no curve, no, like it's just a linear system. And if you take the same input power and include the nonlinearity, but not the shark yet. So the shark is really the, the steady state number. Then we see we already go down by a factor of two. And now if we include the shark, we go actually down to 13 phonons in the, for the parameters of the experiment. So you need the shark, you need nonlinearity to actually go for the same photon number down to this low value. And this is, um, this is just for the expert. We are not at the back action limit before because we cannot drive so strong. And this is also works. So here we see the nonlinear theory nicely matches also the experimental result. And here um, the in the experiment themselves, they were able to go down to 14 phonons. Uh, and um, the moment the, the student working with Nico Diaz Nafal is preparing a theory work which summarizes all the theory findings. But the experimental part is already already in this paragraph. With this, I'd like to acknowledge the collaborators from Gerd Kirchmeier's group and um, also Mathieu Schwann from Share Group. And last but not least, I want to acknowledge the group. So here, the, uh, there's Nico. He did the work on the, um, the Kerr oscillator, the nonlinear stuff, and it's Lindsay who worked on the entanglement generation. And with this, I'm happy to take questions. And as you can see, we have positions available. So if you need a job, please, and are interested, contact me. Thank you, Anya. Um, it was a really nice talk. And now uh, we, we are open for, for questions. Uh, I think uh, Marius uh, Konalakis has a question. Please, uh, can the co-hosts uh, ask him to unmute and you can ask directly your question. Yes, I, I tried to clap, but maybe I asked for a question. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, but I have a question actually. So. Uh, you show at some point um, this optimal detuning, I think, for for uh, cooling delta over omega. Was it something like this? Um, just before, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I guess this this Lorentzian here. Uh, I guess this depends on the the weight of that depends on the nonlinearity and or or not. Basically, also my question is. Well, that's the first question, and the second question would be, what did you search for the optimal nonlinearity for, uh, like, there must be some sweet spot, 
probably uh, for for achieving. Uh... Yes, yes. So the this, this is the the point here is actually that when you're like we are below bifurcation, right? So the thing that I did not have time to mention is that when your your shark gets tilted, right? And and this the point where it's just the uh, close before bifurcation. This is the optimal uh, or like close to the optimum, and then so the steepness is in, in, uh, important. And so yes, nonlinearity is as well important. Yeah, the width here of this optical damping. I I'm not sure how this scales directly, right? But um, but we can or like Nico Nico is also in the audience who can perhaps answer this even better. Has worked out exactly the matching point of when um to connect. Or to exactly extract this optical um, uh, at this point where we have the maximum optical damping uh, as a function of or yeah. Nico, do you want to add something to this? Okay. Like, is there a point where if you become too nonlinear, then you're not, you don't have an advantage anymore? Yeah, yeah. So this is clearly a parameter game. Yeah. So the thing is that we we already have here, like we are at a point when you see. That we cannot, in principle, like the limit really is the back action limit is similar to one in the linear case. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a we have a back action limit as as usual, but we cannot achieve it because we get by stable before um, before we can actually hit that. Yeah. So you are yes, and if you now are more nonlinear, there is an, an issue that you actually cannot drive your system strong enough anymore. That you actually will not be cool. And in the in we, we try to in this in this preprint which is about to come out to really work out all these these points parameter points where it is an advantage and where it's not. But yes, okay. there is the, the 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 logic is not that more nonlinearity is better. It's just find you have to have the right combination to actually um, cool better. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I saw that before. Shut up. Uh, okay, Clara. Thank you for the very nice talk. I was I would have a question about the entanglement part that you showed, um, in print, in specifically about the elimination process that you used. So you basically analyzed the scenario where you just have the two modes, and you also analyzed the scenario with the three modes, where to understand how the entanglement swaps between the two pairs. Um, and so the first question is the logarithmic negativity is, I think, is something that you apply to two modes uh, systems, right? Um, to analyze the, in, to characterize the entanglement. So um, in the three mode scenario, did you always calculate the um, logarithmic negativity in pairs? Or could you also somehow extract an um, entanglement measure for the three mode system? Yeah, 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 totally. Like um, the thing is that you, um... In the end, it's all based on extracting the information or from the covariance matrix, right? We have, uh, uh, and you can straightforwardly take the covariance matrix and also, um, like, think about the entanglement, uh, um, like tripartite entanglement or two entangled to one. Not the, the thing is, what we found it was just not so interesting then. So you you get what you expect. You get a little bit of more entanglement, yeah? um, but you're. Um, you're not going to, uh, but the, the 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 interesting, or what I think is interesting, is interesting like connection to actually the the phase and just like that you can swap. This is persistent, right? And so we we looked at it, and you can you know characterize it uh, in the same way. But it's also something which did not hold any, as far as we could see, not any any more interesting physics. I see, because I was wondering if the if you had access to a, a Tanglin criterion that is defined on all three modes, if you could actually see that through the elimination process, um, the um, sum of the entanglement is lost. But if 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 this um, on the right hand side, however, if the entanglement between one and two was um, perfect, and then so basically my question is, how does this um, um, elimination process change? the entanglement okay okay so so clearly so first of all if we looked into an entanglement of where two modes to one right so this is in the sense then as a tripartite um and then the question is what are you looking at that we, we can even just think about what is happening in if i look at the entanglement between mode one and two if i eliminate or not yeah? the thing is that if you are the way we we assume like the, for the output entanglement it does actually not matter 
if your mole three is uh, more or less damped. So the elimination will not tell you anything. Huh? But, how, but if you are looking at the intracavity entanglement, like just really the entanglement inside, you will see that then the, there's, the entanglement behavior between one and two is pretty similar. But then if you are, but you, there will no entanglement between when mode three is over damped, there will be no entanglement inside of the cavity um, between mode two and three. But if the moment you lift this and you go from the you transition from over damped mode three to a similar or equally damped, like three modes which are equally damped, you will see the buildup of the entanglement. So, but this is something which um, you only see if you look inside, not on the outside. The outside will not care. The steady state entanglement will, will not care about it. That's interesting. Okay, thank you. So, anyone has any more okay. questions? If if not, maybe I have one to close up. So, with these entanglement schemes. Do you have any architecture in mind to implement uh, this thing and see if, how it does in an experimental setup? Yeah, so this, this setup by itself in this form has already been realized, but not in this language in regards of that, like just one loop is in the end a directional amplifier, which has been implemented in a superconducting circuit architecture where you couple three uh, microwave modes via something what we call a Josephson parametric converter, so uh, which is just a mixing element for, for these modes. And you pump this with three tones in the right manner and you arrive exactly at like this non-reciprocal loop where you can root signals and this has, yeah, has been implemented already in 2017, um, but not under the aspect of entanglement. And you can think of all kinds of circuits and interesting would be here to take hotter circuits, like you uh, like going a little bit lower in frequency, um, and then you can do the same thing. You have just to control the interactions between modes. Right? So one interesting thing is clearly is if one of these modes would be mechanical. In principle, this is uh, like doing this in an optomechanical system. Right? But the, the the thing is a little bit: what do you think of output in a mechanical mode? Right? Mm -hmm. Because we entangle the output of a hot mode with another. Um, so there are no flying phonons, uh, or there are phonon waveguides, but not like I don't know if one calls them flying phonons. Mm -hmm. But that would be clearly really interesting to generate um, actually mechanical, uh, which are hot elements, entangle them. But this is, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So if the audience has no more questions, I think we can wrap up here. Uh, thanks again, Anya. Yeah. Ah, wait, uh, Sh Sharare has a question, please. Um, or, oh no, she's clapping, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so we can wrap up here. Uh, before we, we close up, I just remind you all that next week we will have uh, the talk by uh, Professor Odette uh, Zibelberg from um, Zurich. He will talk about strongly correlated open systems from quenched impurity physics to melted exceptional points. It will be really cool. So I hope you all make it to the next week. And with that, have you all a good day. Thank you.